We welcome Dr. Andre Lecoq, who is Professor Emeritus of Hebrew Bible. Dr. Lecoq uh, is, was born in Europe, in Belgium, and educated there. Like uh, pastors Fitzgerald and Moss, he is also the son of a pastor, so we have that common thread moving through our time together. He came here in 1966 uh, to teach at CTS and continued here for about 30 years, retiring in 1996. During his time here, he really inaugurated uh, the seminary's role with Jewish-Christian relations, established the Center for Jewish-Christian Studies at CTS, later expanded to the Center for Jewish-Christian and Islamic Studies at CTS. He's a very prolific author, and that has continued in retirement, uh, perhaps even accelerated in retirement, uh, and most recently has published a three-volume trilogy on the theme of innocence in the Hebrew Scriptures. He's currently working on a book on the historical Jesus, uh, and is finding that there is a lot of material to work with. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Lecoq uh, has students, graduates who are serving in important academic posts all around the country and around the world, and pastors in pulpits who, under his leadership, have engaged in new and fresh and exciting ways in interreligious dialogue, uh, have helped congregations come to understand how to engage persons of other faiths, and perhaps most importantly, has helped us see the text in new ways through the insights of persons of other religious traditions. Today, Dr. Lecoq is going to talk to us about some of the texts that come to us in the season of Advent, uh, which will further enrich our conversation from this morning. As in the morning, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the close of his presentation. And those of you who are sitting here are encouraged to write your questions down for me, and I will uh, present them as unedited as possible. And uh, those of you who are watching online, uh, you can tweet your questions and we'll uh, share them as we have time with Dr. Lecoq. So, thank you for coming and let us welcome our wonderful, not really guest, he's a member of the family, let us welcome our teacher, Andre Lecoq. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Well, it's always a great pleasure to be at CTS, and it's in this uh, wonderful chapel and with a wonderful audience. Due to uh, the short time we are uh, at our disposal, out of the four texts that are uh, presented to us in uh, the year C, I suggest that we focus on two of those texts. One from the Hebrew scriptures, namely uh, Jeremiah 33 verses 14 through 16, and one from the New Testament, namely Luke 21 verses 25 to 36. So let us start, if you wish, with uh, the prophet Jeremiah. Of course, Jeremiah is one of the greatest prophets of ancient Israel, and he was extremely influential uh, after, during, and after his, uh, during his life and after his death. In fact, uh, he starts, or at least the book of Jeremiah starts, with telling us about his vocation. And it's a, a very striking uh, narrative that we have there immediately in the chapter one of uh, Jeremiah telling us that uh, God chose him even before he was born. That as soon as he was uh, uh, conceived in the womb of his mother, uh, God had already chosen him to be his prophet. Well, that was not uh, a very happy thing that happened to him. For the least one can say is that Jeremiah had a very unhappy life mm -hmm. under strict, strict forbiddances and to the 
and demands on the part of God, for instance, not to get married, so he could not even share with the spouse his um, sad life, <laughs> but especially uh, because he was ordered to react very negatively to uh, the policy of the different kings that he knew in Jerusalem in the 7th and the 6th centuries before uh, Christ. So uh, Jeremiah appears very clearly as a defeatist, as someone who said to his people that uh, there was no immunity at all for Zion, for Jerusalem, in spite of a very widespread Ill illusion that uh, the, the Jerusalemites of the time had about uh, their city. It must be said, you see, that uh, in the 8th century, when the Assyrians invaded uh, the entire uh, Middle East, they came close to uh, invest Jerusalem, and for reasons that are in different versions of our text, of the biblical text, uh, for different reasons that we cannot pinpoint with certainty, historical certainty, it happened that uh, the Assyrians withdrew from the siege of Jerusalem and spared, therefore, Jerusalem. This gave to the, in, to the inhabitants of Zion the idea, which became an ideology, in fact, that uh, their city was so protected, so loved by God, that uh, nothing really bad could happen to Jerusalem. And when uh, the Assyrians were uh, followed or by the Babylonians, also from that region of the world that we call today Iraq, well, when the Babylonians uh, aimed to go through Palestine of the time to Egypt, it was always uh, the Mesopotamians aim, always what they wanted to get to, to Egypt, through, of course, the channel of uh, Syria, Syria today, Palestine, to Egypt. Well, uh, they came, of course, to Jerusalem, and inside Jerusalem was Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was absolutely certain that uh, Jerusalem would be destroyed by the Babylonians. Well, now you can imagine how the reaction of the people was to such a message that was so considered as a treason, betrayal. They, they needed all their strength, all their energies to resist the new foes, those Babylonians considered, by the way, as barbarians. And now there was someone inside the place who was saying, do not resist. Surrender, spare the city, spare the country, because God has decided once and for all that Jerusalem will be taken by those people, occupied, and if you resist, will be utterly destroyed. Well, Jeremiah was not just uh, left alone, but he was really persecuted. As, as a traitor, and uh, he, at some point he was almost killed, were it not for the intervention of a friend at the court, at the royal court, who interceded for him and to, indeed spared his life, uh, saved him from a certain death, he would have been killed. And he was also thrown in prison, 
He was also uh, forbidden to come to the temple in Jerusalem. All kinds of things of that nature happened to the poor man who uh, complained to God. And we have, that's by the way, the prophet that we know best. We don't know that much about Jeremiah, but still less about the other prophet of Israel. As also when we turn to Luke, when we speak of Jesus, what do we know of Jesus before the age of 30 is extremely little. Well, uh, let's return to, uh, to Jeremiah. He, we know most about Jeremiah because of all those tribulations in which uh, he was involved and which made him suffer so much. By the way, it is uh, one of the current uh, theories that when we turn to Second Isaiah, to the so-called songs, the four songs of the uh, suffering servant, Jeremiah served as a model for, for that uh, figure, mysterious figure that is both individual and collective, which is called the suffering servant. So it tell, tells you something about, uh, about uh, Jeremiah. And uh, well, Jeremiah complained to God. He, he prayed hard in saying, please choose somebody else. Don't, don't, don't continue to to carry, to make me carry such a burden. I don't want to tell those people what I'm, well, what you compel me to tell them. I want, I want to be at peace with them. I, I don't consider me out of the crowd, out of the people. I am a member of that people. And you say that uh, you have, you are, you are angry against Israel. You are, you are uh, wrath against us, and uh, uh, that's very unpleasant. <laughs> if only I were not born at all, that's what I wish. Well, of course he was born, and he was, he was com uh, compelled to, to say what he was saying to those people. Well, when we think, of course, of uh, the relevance of this for uh, funny ones, 21st century CE, well, it's easy enough to imagine what, what would happen if a prophet amongst us would speak, you know, of America instead of Zion. America the immune, America that nothing really bad can happen to, as Jeremiah was, uh, was saying. There is certainly an entire establishment uh, slant to, to Jeremiah's uh, discourse that is easy enough for us to imagine uh, in terms of uh, modern, modern uh, protest against uh, a certain illusion that uh, nation, this nation which we are proud to be members uh, uh, entertains as uh, a country that is chosen by God, loved by God so much, and blessed by God so much that nothing really bad can happen to us. Well, <laughs> if Jeremiah was amongst us, his, uh, 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 I guess that his message would not be very much different from what it was in the in the sixth and uh, in the sixth, in the seventh and sixth centuries uh, BC, one of the uh, main concern of Jeremiah was the perpetuation of uh, or the proclamation that the, uh, the alliances, that the that the berit in Hebrew, that the, the the covenants that God had made in the past would continue in spite of the condemnation that he was preaching. So we have two faces here. Number one, and we should certainly emphasize that, that face. Number one, a condemnation of the people is a telling them that God is not bound in such a way that uh, he can be disposed of and uh, uh, 
uh, considered as a friend or as someone that uh, you can you can abuse. But the, on the other hand, there is also that part of uh, Jeremiah's uh, uh, proclamation that the covenants of the past are forever, not due to the faithfulness of the people or the righteousness, but due to the faithfulness and righteousness of God himself. God will not permit the covenants to fail. So it's part of this phase that we will have to read the text that we have now in Jeremiah 33. Uh, the covenants that I'm speaking about is, of course, uh, of course, first, the covenant with the whole people at Sinai. And uh, Jeremiah 11 uh, speaks about that covenant that uh, is uh, forever, will never fail. And now also, he speaks about the covenant with the King David, a very famous and very central text in the Hebrew scriptures is in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where the prophet Nathan is uh, promising to David that there will be an eternal dynasty that will continue after, after him. Do you remember, you remember that? that there will be always someone on the throne to follow uh, King David. This, by the way, is the very root of uh, uh, the messianic expectation that uh, was alive ever since. Because when uh, the succession, the dynastic succession was interrupted, precisely at the, when uh, uh, Jeremiah was living, then the people projected in the future, either imminent or more remote, the coming of someone who would be a successor to David, but now uh, the Messiah himself. Well, it is in that uh, context that we turn to Jeremiah 33, and we read those two or three verses that are proposed to our reflection. Jeremiah 33, verse uh, 14 and following. The day, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel, that's the covenant uh, of uh, Sinai, and the house of Judah, in those days and at that time I will cause a righteous branch uh, to spring up for David, and now it's 2 Samuel 7 I mentioned, and, uh, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called the Lord is our righteousness. So the city will be called that. The Lord is our righteousness. By the way, there was a, a, a king that uh, first started to collaborate with the Babylonians and try to, to get them uh, mellow you know, before uh, they would destroy the city. And his name was Sedegaya, which means the righteous. Sadiq in Hebrew, Sedekaya means God is the, is the faithful, God is righteous. God is, uh, keeps faith. Now the Sedegaya at some point uh, changed completely by this policy and with the collaboration of the Egyptians, he, he revolted against the Babylonians. So his name became a joke. Instead of being the one who has faith, the one you can trust, well, he became the one you cannot trust mm -hmm. because he, he, he turns his, uh, 
coat and to betrayed what uh, he had promised by covenant to, to the Babylonians. Anyway, we have now this text uh, of uh, Jeremiah 33 that is uh, a very positive text. And if we had only this, uh, we would have a completely uh, uh, wrong image of what Jeremiah was saying. But he said oh, also that. He said also that uh, all, what he was saying to the people would not be forever. That they, the time would come, the days are surely coming when the covenants of God will, will triumph. When there will be a, a, someone on the throne of David. That the, the dynasty will be restored that there will be a new Jerusalem. A new Jerusalem. Yeah, that's, that's the point. That's not the Jerusalem, if you want. It's, that's not the Jerusalem that uh, Jeremiah was facing at that particular time, but a, a transcendent Jerusalem. A, a Jerusalem that would have reached its fulfillment like when Jeremiah was speaking in the chapter 31 of a new covenant. And you may, you, you remember what he was saying then in Jeremiah 31 when he said uh, that the, the law, the Torah, will not be just uh, written on rock, on, on stone, but in the heart of the people. When uh, let me uh, show you here. The Lord, are sh the days are surely coming. That's also starting that way. Mm -hmm. The same, the same wording as in the chapter thirty-three later. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That's really close to the text that is to our uh, study today. And it will be like a covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them from by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, not, not me, God, that they broke. And then though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to, to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more one of the greatest texts that you can find in the Hebrew scriptures, no doubt. But it's the same idea. Not that uh, one covenant is buried, dead and buried, but that the covenant is transcended. And therefore, and this is one of the most important things that we can think of today, I believe, everything is is promising a transcendent fulfillment of it. If you think of the Exodus, the Exodus will be will will come again, but in a in a in a different form, as 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 the triumphal uh, entry into the kingdom of God. The the Torah is written. But as Jesus will say at some point, well, Moses was uh, lenient with you. And he said things because uh, he was considered traditionally as the author, of the very author of the Pentateuch, hmm, of the Torah. And he, he said things there, for instance, about divorce at that particular point uh, that Jesus was dealing with. He said things because of the weakness of your the weakness of your flesh, but 
it is not so when the Torah has come to its total fulfillment. Then things are different. The people of Israel in itself is a people striving towards its own transfiguration. And speaking of transfiguration, when we read that Jesus was transfigured before his disciples, we should always think of the, of the collected dimension of the Messiah, not just the individual, separated, isolated dimension of, of the Messiah, but also the collective dimension of the Messiah, which with 12, 12 apostles or disciples representing the whole people is constantly surrounded by the community. So that the transfiguration is also the transfiguration of Israel as a people. And through Israel, maybe of the whole world, but this is something that we will speak about in a moment. So, uh, when Luke, to which we will turn, when Luke is uh, uh, calling as a testimony all those texts of the Hebrew scripture, and it's a very remarkable uh, uh, side of the Gospel of Luke, that he, who was a non-Jew, was so uh, eager to call to the Hebrew scriptures uh, as attesting to the fact that indeed that man of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Son of God, etc. Well, he was convinced and tried to convince us that uh, all the uh, elements of the Hebrew scriptures striving towards their own fulfillment had reached with the, Nazar the Nazarene the, at least the beginning of their fulfillment. So uh, let's turn to, to Luke and to say also a few words about, about him, as I say uh, a few words about uh, Jeremiah. So Luke was uh, a, a friend of uh, the Apostle Paul. And uh, it is indeed uh, noticeable how influenced he was by Paul. Paul also uh, appeals to all kinds of uh, sayings in the Hebrew Bible as, as uh, uh, witnessing to the messiahship of, uh, of uh, Jesus. Luke, a physician, uh, was probably born, was probably writing his uh, uh, gospel and the book of Acts, both the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, around 19 CE. That says much already there. Because if you remember, in 70, the city was totally destroyed by the Romans, including the temple. And uh, the city was uh, eventually uh, forbidden to any Jew to live in, in, in the city, and uh, the city was rebaptized, so to speak, uh, into a Roman uh, city. Now, 90, that's the time. Luke has behind him uh, the destruction of the temple and of the city of Jerusalem. And uh, he remembers, or, oh, uh, his sources remember that uh, Jesus said something about that. That he said that uh, the temple would be destroyed in three, and that in three days he would rebuild it. Whatever. It's very difficult to know exactly verbatim what Jesus said. But the, 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 the fact is that certainly he said 
something about the destruction of the temple, about its demise, and that uh, uh, this was uh, uh, taken as uh, a proof that he was uh, a, a quack by those uh, uh, witnesses at his uh, trial that say he said that he would destroy the temple and uh, re-evict it in three days, etc. Okay. Well, Jesus certainly did not say that he would destroy the temple, but he certainly said something about the destruction of the temple to come, an imminent destruction of the temple, and indeed it was destroyed in the year 70. Well, the Jesus that uh, uh, Luke is uh, presenting to us is uh, a Galilean. He spent uh, more, most of his life in Nazareth or in the vicinity. And it is as a Galilean that he started his ministry. Well, the synoptics, that is Mark as, as a source of the other two, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, uh, the, the synoptics say are, are unanimous in, in saying that the, the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist, who preceded uh, Jesus, uh, was a big turn in the in the ministry of Jesus. In fact, a big turn as a beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Because at that point, we have an independent Jesus starting, preaching around, and, uh, uh, healing, and, uh, and, and uh, living in a certain way that uh, increasingly became clear, clearly, a manifestation of messiahship. So, uh, what do we know about uh, the Jesus before the age of 30? For uh, Luke says himself that uh, uh, Jesus started his ministry when he was 30. Uh, in uh, chapter 3, verses 23, for instance, we read, uh, Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his work, etc. Okay. What do we know? Nothing. Well, very close to nothing. When we turn to Luke, the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, or the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, not Mark, but the two, uh, Luke and Matthew, we have a uh, narrative about uh, a extraordinary uh, birth of uh, this Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, it's, a, it's a precious, precious uh, tra tradition indeed that we have in those two Gospels. But the point, in spite of what has been done with those uh, narratives later in the early, even early church, but certainly in the in the later church, is the point is that that was an extraordinary man who was born then. And uh, uh, we could uh, expand on, on this and to show uh, what uh, uh, Philo, for instance, a, philosopher, a Jewish philosopher contemporary with Jesus almost, uh, was saying about the extraordinary births in the, the Hebrew Bible, that uh, each time there is a, a election on the part of God of some individual, the text always has a way, the, text, the Hebrew text has always a way to show that the birth of that particular individual is extraordinary. It's not just like John 1 would say, according to the gods and the flesh, but, but a, 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 a birth that God welcomed, that, that God was expecting. So, 
Anyway, apart from that, and apart from the visitation of Jesus at the age of 12 in the Temple of Jerusalem, which, by the way, plays quite a, a, a big role in the Gospel of Luke, the Temple of Jerusalem, which uh, is uh, seen very positively, although with uh, the prediction that it would be destroyed at some point. Well, uh, uh, we know very little. It, for that matter, you know, we, we, we know very little also of uh, the beginning of the life of Jeremiah. How, how did those people, charismatic as they were, how, how, how did they know what they knew? How did Jesus know? How did Jesus have the authority that is recognized uh, through, throughout the gospel? Uh, how did he get, he got this authority? Did he, was he schooled? Did, did he go to, to, the tent, to, to the synagogue of the place? But we don't know whether there was a synagogue in Nazareth. There is no trace of it. Uh, how did he know? How, how did he have that authority? One has to conclude, really, that uh, it was not schooling that made him what he was, what Jesus was, but really a charisma, a charisma that is given uh, directly by God. Anyway, that's how Luke certainly prepares us uh, to meet that uh, Jesus that uh, he wants us to, to know. So, uh, at the baptism by John the Baptist, which is certainly a, uh, a historical fact, which gives us the occasion to open it with parenthesis. So how do we know what is historical and what is uh, elaborate later by the, God, by the gospel writers? Well, when it's embarrassing as an element of an, an embarrassment for, for the church, then we, we, we can be almost certain that this is a historical fact. <laughs> and to have Jesus confessing sins so as to receive the baptism of John. The baptism is certainly very embarrassing for the church. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is something prob very probably historical here. And then at the baptism, you remember, there is what the Hebrew calls a bat call, a voice coming from heaven declaring him to be the Son of God. Whatever happened historically again, there we don't know. But uh, as, as historians would, would say, we don't know. But we know certainly that, that Jesus at that point had a consciousness born that he was playing a central role in the, the advent of the kingdom of God. Through inspiration, through the spirit, that plays a, a very important role in the Gospel of Luke, uh, the Holy Spirit. Anyway, uh, the call was to be uh, a prophet at least. So in Act uh, chapter 13, there is uh, the accent put on the fact that Jesus was a great prophet. And uh, 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 through, through the Spirit and to more, and more than a prophet. The Jesus that uh, uh, Luke presents to us is, uh, uh, as I said before, very concerned with the uh, collective dimension of messiahship. He, he chooses 12 disciples according to the number of the tribes of Israel as reconstituted, for Israel had been dispersed and uh, the 10 northern tribes had been so thoroughly uh, exiled and uh, uh, integrated in other countries and nations that uh, they disappeared completely. Now, Jesus, uh, by, by choosing the 12, already says that there will be a restore total Israel and uh, a, 
and also by the fact that uh, Jesus is so keenly interested, to say the least, with all the, the people, all the, 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 the men and the women of, uh, of the nation, so that he, he entertains a close relationship with uh, the downtrodden, with the disenfranchised, with people who were considered as uh, the scum of the society because they were collecting taxes for the enemy, for, for the Romans, that uh, the, the tax collectors, with prostitutes, with you name it. And uh, certainly he had a, uh, a very shocking, for the time, shocking relation with women and, uh, as I said, with, uh, uh, with the downtrodden. Also, and this interests uh, uh, Luke, of course, particularly, also with foreigners, with Gentiles. We have time and again in the Gospel of Luke, uh, the concern of Jesus with uh, foreigners. And it's not a, 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 an inborn time of thing for Jesus, because we find him, for instance, being very harsh, even cruel, when with uh, the Syrophoenician woman is asking him to heal her daughter. Uh, he said, well, I, I did not come for you people. Because you, we, we cannot uh, uh, distribute the bread that is for for the for the family to dogs. Yes, he says, but the dogs are eating the the crumbs uh, that fall from the table under the table. A very moving, very profound, and moving saying of the part of that woman, and Jesus acknowledges that immediately. That, of course, interests uh, Luke very much because he himself is a non-Jew. All right. Now, in the chapter 23, uh, in the chapter 20, 21, uh, verses 25 and following, we read this. That's apocalyptic, in fact. And there is a side of uh, Jesus' message that is indeed apocalyptic. There will be signs of the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. Now when, the, when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Well, I have not mentioned that before, but of course uh, that's uh, one of the most uh, strikingly beautiful thing in the teaching of Jesus that he was speaking in parables. I wish we had time to speak uh, of uh, the nature of uh, Jesus' parables. Anyway, so he said that, uh, that parable, look at the fig tree and all the trees, as soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Another very important uh, feature in the gospel, the kingdom of God that uh, is uh, sprouting with, uh, with the presence of, of the Nazarene himself. Mm -hmm. That uh, is one of the main themes of the Gospel of Matthew, but also uh, very much so in the Gospel of Luke. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all those things 
take, take place. Heaven and earth will pass, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the worries of this life. And that, and, and that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times. Pray that you may have the strength to escape all the things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Son of Man. That's the favorite designation, self-designation of Jesus. We find that scores of times when he speaks about himself, at least about himself, he uses the term son of man. Now that's very ambiguous or ambivalent because it means anyone, the son of man, that's a little like a, today we'll say, hello man, or something like that. that that's anyone. And uh, in order to avoid the first person singular, which is uh, maybe taken as uh, a little ostentatious, I, me, etc. Well, uh, in Aramaic, they, they could use that term, the son of man. And it means me, it means I. Mm -hmm. So no man does this or does that. I do this or that. So that's that's one one meaning. The other one is very different, and it's a title that was inaugurated by Daniel, the Book of Daniel. Again, a very important source for the New Testament, extremely important, especially the chapter seven of Daniel where there is a vision of someone like a son of man who comes on the, in the clouds with, uh, enthroned with God. So here, the son of man becomes a messianic title, a glorious title. That's uh, someone who is eschatologically uh, coming and uh, will bring about the kingdom of God. So, uh, here, to be uh, standing before the Son of Man, uh, that's, of course, uh, the Son of Man of Daniel 7. Not just uh, anyone, but uh, the one who is the glorious Son of God. Apocalypse. Well, some New Testament scholars have insisted uh, very much on that aspect of uh, Jesus' message, that uh, Jesus would be an uh, apocalyptic, a charismatic apocalyptic. To some, expect, to some extent, it is true that uh, Jesus, when speaking about uh, the future, which, by the way, he thinks to be very imminent, as uh, the text says uh, here that uh, uh, that uh, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place, and there are other texts uh, to the same to the same effect uh, that uh, the the early church uh, really believed that uh, the parousia, so called, the, the coming glory of the Son of Man, would be very imminent that the people who were living, at least some of them would be witnessing the coming of that uh, Son of Man in glory, uh, uh, that uh, uh, is part of uh, the apocalyptic uh, preaching of Jesus, that uh, the time is ripe and, to, and to, uh, we are close to the end. After that, of course, and seeing that the generation after generation passed without the coming of the parousia, the church had to reinterpret uh, all those words and that are, again, very certainly historical because of the embarrassment that they create mm -hmm. in the church in not seeing uh, the, the prediction coming to truth. 
coming to be, uh, then the church had to reinterpret in the way that we do until today in saying, well, each generation has to face the, the coming of Christ. Uh, each generation has to be prepared to uh, welcome the kingdom of God. Each generation prays to be not trapped, as the text uh, says here. Pray that, uh, pray that you may have the strength to escape uh, the, uh, all these things that will take place and to stand before the, the Son of God, the Son of Man. Well, maybe I should uh, stop here uh, remembering that uh, the prayer uh, that uh, the text is speaking about here uh, was already a theme in uh, Luke uh, chapter 1 when uh, uh, God, uh, the angel says to uh, Zechariah, not the prophet, but the, the Zechariah of the New Testament, do not be afraid for your prayer has been heard. Well, let's hope that uh, our prayer is also heard so that we may escape all those things that are so ominously announced in the text of Luke uh, 21 here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lecoq. Uh, we have a, some time now for questions and response, and let me uh, begin, uh, take the privilege of beginning with a question, and then if you have a question you want to bring forward, uh, Martha will collect them, or you can tweet them to us. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it was good to, to hear your teaching today. Uh, I'd like to focus on the phrase transcendent fulfillment, which seems to be a kind of overarching theme for these two texts, and identify two anxieties that I think we carry with us with a phrase like that and see how you respond. The first anxiety is that it can lead to a sense of otherworldliness, that it lifts us beyond the historical here and now, the realities of life, the place of incarnation. Uh, and, and so I think there's a tendency, because of that anxiety, to, for, for many preachers to step back a little from that sense of transcendent fulfillment of the, the by and by, the sweet by and by, uh, and, and be anxious about these kinds of texts. And the second, of course, is something that you've done a lot of work on, and that's how do we avoid the notion that, that the new covenant is, is transcending moving beyond uh, better than uh, even superseding the old covenants uh, in a kind of supersessionism that in extreme forms is a kind of Christian Zionism today perhaps and its own triumphalism. So how do we engage these texts in the face of these two anxieties of, of transcending beyond the historical realities of life that are the arena of incarnation, and how do we avoid a transcendent fulfillment that supersedes the enduring covenant that is sustained? All right, <laughs> thank you. Um, two, two things must be said about, uh, or a double thing must be said about uh, Jesus speaking about the end of times. Number one is that there is a present eschatology, so to speak, a fulfilled eschatology that uh, Jesus at least uh, developed a consciousness of uh, a, that, that the time that he was uh, living was the end time and that uh, he was uh, the uh, center 
or the operator of um, a rule of God, or kingship of God, here and now. And that must be uh, emphasized uh, at all times, that uh, there is a, a fulfilled eschatology, a transcendent eschatology of the present, here, now. But at the same time, and that's the second aspect of, uh, of uh, that preaching, I think, of Jesus, that uh, it is coming. That is already, but not yet, already with, uh, with all with the presence of, uh, of the Messiah, the presence of uh, the, the kingdom, the, the, the king of the kingdom of God. Uh, that, that's prophetic, of course, when Pilate puts him as a title on, on the cross, uh, king of the, of the Jews. Uh, yes, um, we, we already have everything. <laughs> We are already in the kingdom of God, but but uh, in in hope also, a hope that uh, that kingdom <coughs> will become true uh, beyond any hardship, beyond any uh, hurdle, and universal, and not just for some and not for others, and uh, uh, and so forth. So it's. I think that the formula, which is not mine, of course, you know it very well, already, not yet, is, uh, is correct, is, is saying the two sides of the same reality. Paul is speaking about uh, the uh, first down payment, so to speak, uh, of uh, the kingdom, and uh, that the, and, and it's, it's quite clear that at the, that time, even of Paul and uh, of the gospel writers, they, those people thought that uh, um, the, the, the present would be the future, or the future would be the present. That is, it would come so, so fast now, uh, so unexpectedly fast that uh, uh, the present would be collapsed with the future or the future with the present. We live dramatically in a separation of, the, of those two times with, with a space in between. We, uh, we, we cannot uh, uh, necessarily uh, think that uh, the kingdom of God is for uh, 10 minutes from now, or 10 years from now, we don't know. But it's precisely what the text is saying here, pray. Hmm? Pray at all times. There is a very interesting <laughs> and amusing, in a way, uh, rabbinic, uh, in fact, Hasidic uh, story, no, saying that uh, the, the, the founder of uh, Hasidism of the 18th century, Poland said, uh, you have to repent one day before dying. Yeah, well, <laughs> one day before dying, yes. But when, when are you dying? <laughs> All right, so, so is it. Um, and uh, the, other th the other part of this question is uh, rather painful, that supersessionism of uh, the Christian church that we have absolutely to refuse. We are, the church is not superseding Israel. The church has been grafted to Israel. That, that totally different. We are coming second. Christians, when no, non-Jews like Luke, are coming second, not first. First, the Jews, then those who are not. Because it is through the Jewish scripture and through the Jewish history and through the Jewish suffering that uh, we are who we are. 
and we we have to pay to pay respect and uh, uh, gratefulness to those who have brought to us uh, Yahweh, the God, the living God, not an idol, but the creator of heavens and earth and uh, redeemer uh, of the whole world. Luke is very interested, of course, in universalism. Hmm? But he calls all the time uh, the, the Hebrew scripture as a, as a witness to that. Thank you. Uh, this next question is uh, raising the issue of diverse perspectives of messianism in uh, the Jewish community at the time of Jeremiah, but also at the time of Jesus. So let, let me read the question to you. Can you share about the way or ways that diverse Jewish readers might have understood Jeremiah's themes during the Second Temple period in the Diaspora? Were, there, were their understandings of messianic promise very diverse? And in light of that, what advice do you have for the preacher who wants to highlight the intra-Jewish divisions during the time of Christ's life and the later period of the destruction of the temple. How should these inform our remembering of the hopes for Messiah and of the coming of the Son of Man that Jesus talked about? So historically, it would be helpful to remember that the messianism or the, mess the messiah expectation, expectation of the messiah was born at a time when it was realized in the people of Israel that there, there would not be any successor to David on David's throne. That second, second temple period, that is uh, after the return from exile, they uh, first of all enthroned, quote unquote, enthroned Zerubbabel, a man who disappeared through a trap of history. We don't know what happened to Zerubbabel, but certainly he was not what uh, they had expected first uh, him to be. That is the successor of, of David. So Israel was under the Assyrians, then after, in the Babylonians, then after the Persians then after of the Greeks, then after of the Romans. <laughs> they, they were not uh, an independent nation by any stretch of imagination, so there would be no king in Israel to come. Hence, there was a projection in, in, the, in the future and a idealization of that successor to David. That would be the successor to David. That would be the one, the unique, the transcendent one, the fulfilled successor that would replace all the successors possible and imaginable. And that would be the Messiah. Messiah means, of course, just uh, the anointed one. That would be the anointed one, the, the one that God had uh, in his treasure uh, from the beginning of the world. And he would give that one. And uh, we, at that time, uh, we would realize, the people would realize that uh, what Nathan the prophet was promising to David was in fact to be interpreted as there will be always the successor to David on the throne. Not just a, a, a concatenation of successors, but the successor uh, par excellence. The, the, the Davidai, the Davidai. And the Gospels, the, the Gospels try very hard, in fact, to show us that Jesus was, was the, the successor to David. 
So they imagine even a census that uh, history does not back up, a census by which uh, Mary and Joseph had to go to Bethlehem because there was the prophecy of Micah chapter 5 that uh, the Messiah would be born in, Beth in Bethlehem. So Jesus was born in Bethlehem and uh, uh, there was a, a way to speak of Joseph as not the real father, but on the other hand, he is indispensable in the genealogy of Jesus to be a, a, a descendant of David. So, so uh, there is a, an embarrassment again there on the part of, uh, of uh, the early church to show something that uh, history does not necessarily back up, okay, but which is more theological than historical. And we know that the Gospels were written, the, the Roman Christians were saying, ad probandum, not non ad narandum. It's not to narrate something, it's to prove something. That's why the, the Gospels were written. They prove something. So, uh, the, the big question was, what, what kind of being will be that Messiah when he comes? So, during the early Second Temple period, the priests had become the most important function in the, uh, among the people. There was no prophet left, it looks like, no prophecy, no, no kingship, and the third function, that priesthood. So the priesthood became the, the eminent uh, function in Israel, the temple became central uh, in a way that it had never been that much before. And therefore, there was a speculation that the Messiah would be a high priest, not the king anymore, but the priest, or maybe the two together, etc., etc. So speculations about uh, what kind of Messiah is coming. And the, when Jesus uh, is so cautious, when the term Messiah is pronounced <laughs> to him, that uh, yes, but, or maybe no, but, that, uh, that, that isn't why, you know, because the people were, were filling the form Messiah with all kinds of things that uh, Jesus did not necessarily agree with. So he avoids the term until Peter tells him, you are the Messiah. And Jesus says, yes. But immediately corrects Peter in a very strict way, as you remember, calling him even Satan. Uh, be because, because there were so many speculations, diverse speculations, and certainly at the time of Jesus, a, the a, a most destructive one was that the Messiah would be the leader of a revolution against the Romans, against all, all possible revolution because the Romans were hundred times more powerful than any people would, would uh, be against them in Palestine. But uh, there was a dream. There was, there was the, the delusion, like in the time of Jeremiah, the illusion that, uh, that uh, with, with two, you would, you would triumph over 2,000. And certainly Jesus is not, is not a, a leader, a zealot, uh, that the son would, would expect him to be. So he is extremely cautious. Well, as we draw our time to a close, I'd like to conclude with one final question. Okay. 
uh, and I'm going to paraphrase a bit what was, was handed to me. Uh, in Jeremiah's time, Israel lived under a version of occupation, exile, occupation, uh, defeat. In Jesus' time, Jews lived under occupation. Today we're preaching arguably in an imperial mode that the United States is the empire and we're preaching in the context of a triumphalist state, perhaps the ideology of the illusion. So how do we preach these texts in this very different kind of context? Well, I think that uh, uh, raising the question is already answering the question. We certainly have to uh, not be trapped into this triumphalism which has come, which come from Satan, <laughs> we, we, which is not possible uh, in, in our preaching. And uh, it, it's, it's, well, I, I don't want to, to show too much my, my political uh, uh, inclination, but, but there, there are people who, who, who uh, equate uh, riches and power and uh, uh, success, uh, social, economical success, with a blessing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's not what uh, Jeremiah was preaching. That's not what Jesus was preaching. No, he, to the young man who wanted to, to follow him, you remember, he says, uh, let the dead bury their dead and follow me and leave behind everything. Uh, to follow Jesus in no uncertain terms is uh, sharing in his uh, not having uh, a place where to rest, in uh, knowing that uh, the choice that he made of his destiny because it's his choice. The choice he made of his destiny led him to suffering and even to death. Well, it's far from being triumphant. It's far from triumphalism. It's, uh, it's the opposite of it. And, uh, and our preaching will be authentic, I believe, to the very extent that we do not buy those slogans that uh, uh, because this country is arguably the most powerful in the world today, who knows about tomorrow, but the most powerful today, well, it means that uh, we are in the special care of God. No, no, that's not true. That's not, the Bangladesh is not uh, rejected by God because, or Haiti. Uh, rejected by God because they are poor, uh, like Job. Uh, it's, it's simply not true. That's, that's uh, uh, gracious on the part of God, yes, but uh, it's certainly a responsibility that God has put on our shoulders, a heavy responsibility, rather than a elating privilege. Mm -hmm. So, well, uh, that's two sides of, uh, of uh, the same thing, probably. Some would say, well, but still, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, but think that God has a, a certain partiality for America. So be it. <laughs> I pray that it be, but, but uh, I'm sure it's not. As far as I'm concerned. Well, let's thank uh, Professor Lecoq for his marvelous presentation.